Hi, everyone. This is Vera Kichanova from Free Cities Foundation. We are a dedicated team of professionals working together to support innovation in governance uh, and boost human freedom and prosperity around the world. And the last few weeks have been very busy for us because we are only a few days away from an exciting event. Very soon we shall meet in Prague for a conference called Liberty in Our Lifetime. We have an impressive list of speakers from Brazil to Senegal to Serbia. We will talk about seasteading, blockchain, urban growth in Latin America, Africa, the future of education. Check the full program at lifetimeliberty.com. The conference takes place in Prague, but you can also participate online. And speaking of education, students can buy discounted tickets for both online and offline parts. Today, we will also talk about education, the freedom of education. My guest today is Michael Strong, a tireless promoter of innovative governance and innovative learning. He is the founder and CEO of the Socratic Experience, an online school that teaches students to think for themselves. Michael has launched a number of brick and mortar schools in the US, in Texas and California. Some of them were ranked as the country's best. And students from schools uh, that Michael worked with have been admitted to Harvard, Stanford, Georgetown and other top universities. On top of all that, Michael has been uh, very active in the Free Cities movement for over 15 years. He was one of the earliest investors in charter cities in Honduras and later supported a range of projects in Africa. Today, he is consulting Prospera, a startup city in Honduras, on building an innovative education system. Michael, it is great to have you here today and thank you for your time. Uh, my first question is, uh, you joined the Free Cities movement, uh, as they say, before it was cool. A lot has changed in the world in the last 15 years, some things to the better and some things, unfortunately, to the worse. Uh, are we closer or further from achieving liberty in our lifetime compared to 15 years ago? Well, thank you, Vera. First of all, I'm optimistic by nature, and so I'm going to... Uh you know, have the optimistic view. First, um, we are absolutely in better shape. It, there are so many more projects. Um, in some ways, you know, the Honduran ZAs were, you know, obviously pioneering legislation. But since then, you know, when, when I uh, got started, the Charter City, Cities Institute hadn't been launched yet. Um, you know, the Free Private Cities Organization had not been launched yet. The Adrianopolis group had not been launched yet. You know, there's been a plethora of uh, startup societies that have not been launched yet. Um, now we've got the Catawba Digital Economic Zone that's been launched, and of course, Prospera and the um, other zones in Honduras. So we've got a very vibrant global movement. Um, I think, you know, depending on when you count a zone as kind of a, a thing, we could easily have between 10, 20, 30 different projects going at various stages of reality. Um, and I would say that one of the most exciting things for me, actually, is the incredible influx of young talent coming in. You know, the fact that, um, you know, people your age and your generation are dedicating their, their lives to this, in essence. Um, you know, that's the ultimate investment is to, to dedicate your life to a movement. And, um, you know, I think it was a weird, crazy idea 15 years ago. Now it is a global movement with multiple organizations a lot of talent and capital, um, and a lot of different models. And I think that kind of rich, diverse ecosystem is critical. I've described this many times as the uh, arguably the largest industry of the 21st century, which may seem strange right now, but once these get going, the magnitude of land value gains alone, not to mention other commercial activity that's gonna take place in these zones will truly be mind boggling. So, um, absolute growth. And actually, one other data point, just special economic zones alone. In the 70s, there were maybe 20 zones around the world, 25, 30. Now there are thousands, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, depending on how you count. And out of those zones, the number of zones, say, with distinctive legal systems has grown. So certainly the, the three zones in uh, Honduras, 
the Dubai International Financial Center, the Abu Dhabi Financial Center, Kazakhstan has a common law zone, um, Rwanda has a common law zone, and there are other such, I believe it's Colombia, I believe, is piloting a common law zone as well. And so this um, zones with new legal system has also exploded dramatically. So yeah, I'm absolutely bully on the movement. I think it's uh, obviously three steps forward and two steps back. Um, Honduran president is not kind to us, but overall mm -hmm. huge growth, huge positive movement. I really, really like your optimism. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing it uh, with us. Uh, so why do you think, of course, part of the picture is uh, that pioneers like you have been working tirelessly in this direction, but probably also this, there are some uh, global tendencies that have that push people more towards looking for, so to say, unconventional uh, solutions to problems. Uh, what what do you think also contributed to this rising interest? Sure, I, I think for people who really understand new institutional economics, um, most governments, most places are hopeless. <laughs> I'll just be blunt. And so when you've got poor countries around the world who don't, you know, at least some people in those countries don't want to continue to be poor, once you understand that a zone strategy is more likely to lead to um, you know, serious deep reforms in the institutions than mm -hmm. our nationwide changes, um, then the obvious solution is to work towards zone strategies. You know, I, I will give Paul Romer credit for being a mainstream economist who saw this again 15 years ago. And I wish far more mainstream economists were outspoken about this. Uh, actually, another data point on the positive side, Noah Smith, who's a center-left economist, actually proposed um, basically a free city in Japan to address Japanese stagnation. I think for anyone who understands public choice theory 101, new institutional economics 101, the benefits of markets 101, it's kind of a no-brainer. So to some extent, the underlying dynamics are overwhelming and it's a matter of when will more of these economists you know get some courage and uh be outspoken advocates of this movement that's that's basically what i'm waiting for mm -hmm. a few years ago you called uh honduran charter cities uh i quote probably the most free market governing entity in modern history is that still the case so certainly I, I think you know prospera claims to have the most economic freedom in the world and i think absolutely they still do um, you know, they're in a serious uh, battle with Honduran government about sustaining their legal autonomy. And so for that to be true going forward, obviously they have to win their legal battles vis-a-vis -vis the Honduran government. I think it would be absolute economic suicide for the Honduran government to renege on these commitments in any significant way. You know, I imagine the, uh, the president has a reason to try to achieve symbolic victories. As you know, most of politics is just symbolic. I always think of politics as noise, froth, froth on the surface of the ocean. And so I'm sure she'll do everything she can to claim victories, but as long as uh, the underlying legal structure doesn't change much, um, I would say a prosperous future looks bright. And uh, yeah, right now the region with the most economic freedom in the world, and I look forward to competitors outdoing them uh, in the next decade. Mm -hmm. Uh, what so you probably agree that uh, that's the most difficult about uh, building startup city the most difficult thing is to make the host country stick to the agreement what sort of leverages uh, can the developer use uh, to make their uh, projects more less vulnerable to political uh, changes no that's a really really good question so there are kind of layers to that question um you know, I'm not a fan of, you know, the U.S. dictating things to the rest of the world, but the fact is if the U.S. supports, certainly in Honduras, if the U.S. supports the legislation there, it has a much stronger chance of succeeding. And conversely, if the U.S., I mean, people always said, aren't you afraid of the Honduran government? And I would always say, I'm more afraid of the U.S. government. Because if the U.S. government wants to kill something, it will be dead. Whereas, uh, you know, if the U.S. supports something, you know, it's it's hard for other countries to go against the U.S. given our overwhelming influence. That's not the only thing, obviously, but, um, you know, I think being embedded in an international framework uh, of commercial law, commercial arbitration, where reneging on these commitments is painful, is costly, 
and there's awareness among both the leadership and, well, the leadership, the business community, and the people that it's costly. That's why actually educating people at all levels is critical. Now, I would love to have this discussed at Davos, people at Davos saying, oh, no, um, this country might renege on a commitment, you know, because these people have plenty at stake globally. They can't afford to have countries around the world, uh, you know, appropriating appropriating capital and that's in essence what it is when they renege on these legal agreements um below that of course i think uh popularity of the zone is critical and you know bob haywood the former director of the world economic processing zones association pointed out that even when honduras had a hard left government before the conventional free zones continued to be supported because there were a hundred thousand jobs if you've got a people with a hundred thousand jobs you know, even a leftist government thinks twice before shutting it down. So the critical stage is before we have created enough jobs, um, and this is where the Honduran Zetes are, they've not yet created enough jobs to have that deep support. And so it's nurturing that support as we get there. You know, there are other incentives, you know, in theory, the Honduran legislation um, has financial incentives for the central government to continue it. I think that's still a good strategy. In general, I think Latin America is crazy leftist in a way the rest of the world isn't. You know, again, my wife and I work a lot in Africa. And in Africa, they're not anti-capitalist in the same, I would say, stupidly reflexive way that many Latin American you know, leaders are. And so I think a lot of African leaders are pragmatic, more pragmatic. And that if we can show that um, there will be revenue coming to the central government and you know, with key stakeholders, they'll they'll be more likely to support it. I think you know, money can talk in a good way that way. So if you create jobs, prosperity, um, give the leader you know a feather in, a ca in his cap or her cap uh, for creating jobs and prosperity, and the public understands that this jobs and prosperity depend on the legal autonomy of the zone, uh, then I think we have a win-win cycle. Again, none of this is easy, as as you know, uh, this will require thousands and thousands of brilliant people working hard to move things in the right direction. But I think over time, it's a winnable battle. Mm -hmm. So speaking of the public support, we see uh, in uh, many cases, uh, people very fiercely opposing projects like that. Uh, why is it so? What would you say to them, if, if anything, that could make change their mind? Well, I think the tricky part is the first part of this is um, egregious lying on behalf of the media and the leadership. So in Honduras, when I had an hour to talk to just about anyone, and we, we spoke to workers groups, business groups, legal groups, nonprofit groups, if you have an hour to explain it to people, then almost everyone would support it. Uh, but, you know, as somebody who's written your, her dissertation on this, you know, one has to understand the whole institutional framework, why it matters, why this is not just a win for the investors, why it's a win for everyone, why the countries are currently poor, why there currently are not enough jobs. Um, you know, there's a bit to be explained. And this is why I actually think that um, as we get more and more people understanding these issues more deeply, then each you know one-on-one -on -one won't take as long because people will be properly informed. Right now, you know, especially in Honduras, there's just there are crazy things said that have no bearing on reality at all. And then when something like The Guardian in Britain repeats the insanity, they think you guys are perpetuating poverty. So ultimately, I'd like to see our movement have definitively the moral high ground in academia, in the media, in leadership circles. Because again, I think we're the only path to prosperity for 8 billion people on earth. So hello, this is why, again, my wife is even more credible and aggressive about this. You idiots, you're keeping poor people poor. What's wrong with you? Mm. Um, and as long as you know, we get enough people to understand this, then eventually people understand this intellectually, they'll respect what we're doing as a critical movement to global prosperity, and we'll have a tailwind instead of a headwind. You mentioned that uh, in Africa, you don't see such strong anti-capitalist sentiment. Uh, and we know, again, in, in Honduras, uh, one of the like biggest accusations against Zerez was uh, the neocolonialism. Uh, and I would imagine people in Africa to also take this uh, things very sensitively of uh, Western investors coming and building something on a large scale. Why do you think that uh, African people are more uh, friendly towards such projects? 
Well, I, I think kind of backing up a little bit, I think one of the reasons Latin America is so um, you know, hostile is the US has an ugly history of uh, you know, colonial intervention in countries across Latin America. So they rightly um, are concerned about things that the US has done in the past in Latin America. Um, the U.S. does not have that same history. Uh, you know, European powers uh, colonized most of Africa. And, you know, the U.S., I think, generally has a positive, you know, reputation in Africa. That said, I think in order to avoid the concern about colonialism, I actually think it's really critical to both develop plans and then uh, create realities on the ground that improve lives for local people. And actually that's one of the reasons education is a big concern for me is that if we can create high quality, low cost education um, in developing countries, you know, knowledge work is my big thing. So if people in one generation can go from being agricultural laborers to their children being knowledge workers and incomes go up 10 X, um, you know, the locals will support you. <laughs> If, on the other hand, everybody is still, you know, a gardener, a maid, to use kind of a cliche, and it's all wealthy white people, then it's going to be perceived as neo-colonialist and hated. And so I see absolutely essential to this project uh, is uh, creating pipelines of upward mobility for locals. Mm -hmm. You obviously, to, to make it more credible, you obviously need local people uh, on board. Uh, how do, who are these people? Uh, how do you... Uh, team up with them? How do you find partners on the ground? No, that's a great question. And in general, you know, I've spoken in a lot of countries and, um, you know, I would say entrepreneurs around the world, uh, I think are actually similar. I've spoken in, you know, EO entrepreneur organizations in multiple countries. And even if the country, you know, countries have very different cultures. So Guatemalan countries, different from Senegalese culture and so forth and so on. But I find the entrepreneurs in general are more forward-looking, dynamic, pragmatic, less ideological. How do we get it done? You know, let's just do stuff. And so I always look for the more entrepreneurial people in any country. And, you know, in many cases, the bureaucrats are the last people to work with. But also, you know, there are a lot of people in a lot of countries are stuck with establishment orientations. The corporate people are, let's keep doing the corporate people, the NGOs, let's do the NGO thing. There are actually relatively few dynamic, entrepreneurial, visionary people in any country, but you know, through our networks, we can find them. Part of it is um, communicating in public and talks and writing and social media and so forth, these ideas. And then we have people reaching out to us. You know, um, again, my wife was uh, on Jordan Peterson this summer and she's had thousands and thousands of people reach out to her for whom the message resonates. And it's, you know, how do we organize this army of like-minded people uh, to get someplace? So people, including people with us, with concrete projects. Exactly. Concrete projects. Um, in some ways, though, I think the attitude is the most important thing. Um, you know, even early hires, you know, often the entrepreneur gets all the attention in the startup. The entrepreneur is critical, but early hires are important as well. And the DNA of a company is set with, you know, the first five, 10 employees. And so we're, uh, I would say philosophical alignment is number one. And I don't want to work with anybody who's not philosophically aligned. So when we're talking to people, you know, they don't have to be, as it were, kind of hard, you know, Mises or anything. But ideally, they're basically sympathetic to entrepreneurs and free markets. They get it uh, without a long explanation. They take responsibility. They're eager to work hard to get somewhere. You know, there's a whole kind of constellation of attitudes, both personally and, you know, institutionally that are important and uh, yeah as we develop large cohorts of these people um, we'll be able to organize them to create the new institutions that are needed for prosperity around the world mm -hmm. you're talking about the initiatives in africa can you name anything at this um, point? i can't no we have to keep it confidential because of course okay. part of the thing is with governments you know I, I, part of the problem with honduras is the enemies the enemies had too much of a head start and so mm. we we need to, there's sort of, I, I use the metaphor of, um, you know, antibodies, that is kind of the anti-capitalist antibodies are ready to attack. And also the crony capitalists, people whose, uh, you know, crony businesses might be, um, you know, have competition with, with new initiatives. And so there are all these, uh, both cronies and anti ideological anti-capitalists that are ready to attack. And so even though it's not as bad in Africa as in Latin America, they still exist. And so we want to, you know, again, ideally we have this roadmap so people can see, wow, 
this investment is going to be incredible. These jobs are going to be incredible. This education is going to be incredible. You know, healthcare as well. You know, we've got all these pieces in place and people can see a path forward. Um, so we have the support basically lined up before the antibodies can attack. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, sound, that sounds very pragmatic. So, okay, can we can we hope to hear a bit more information at the conference? Uh, not at the conference. No, this is on the year of, you know, I would say these projects are on a dec decade by decade yeah. timescale. But I think this one, hopefully within a year, two years, three years, we ought to be able to make an announcement. Um, and, you know, I understand TDIS has something else going on. And I like competition. Hmm. I'd love to see in the next three years, five to 10 African projects uh, go public. And then I think if those succeed, or if some of them succeed, I actually think Africa could be a very rapid mover in this space because their need for institutional improvement is so tremendous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I will move to the questions more, more related to edu your educational uh, work. So mm -hmm. first, a little bit back to Honduras. So your role, you have been involved with the charter cities in Honduras for about 15 years. And, but your role has changed. So first you were an investor. Now you are mainly an educational advisor. That's correct? So I completely backed out for a while. I mean, after, after the original uh, red legislation was overturned, it looked like it was going to be dead for a long time. And, you know, I'm from the United States. I'm not from down there. So I came back and uh, had really no participation for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in touch with people who are still involved. And, you know, now, uh, you know, I'm working with them in a variety of ways. Uh, certainly, um, one part of this is education and kind of education in a couple of directions. On the one hand, there's, uh, you know, educating the public and, you know, I'm making some proposals there in terms of their community. Um, but also, you know, pathways to jobs. And really, I'm more involved in creating a model for that on the Africa side. But you know, as a state-led institution around the world, very traditional. And most people believe you have to go through, you know, K-12, and then you have to go to university. And once you have a degree, then you can go get a job. And of course, that's ridiculous in the modern world. Um, tech, you know, a lot of my focus is preparing people for digital work. And, you know, in the United States, I work with teenagers, 12, 13, 14, who are making money online. I've got one student who made $4,000 trading Instagram handles in a weekend. You know, and if I could train an African kid to do that, oh my God, he'd be, you know, absolutely dazzling to his community. Um, you know, social media, you know, people who know how to optimize social media are valuable everywhere. Coding and software development, that's well known. Graphic design, video production, all these things. There's so many great jobs. And the fact is teenagers are often digital natives. They know the technology, they live and breathe it. And I always look at the K-12, you know, the secondary school curriculum and think, okay, why are they taking high school chemistry when they could learn to, you know, spread content on YouTube? Mm. <laughs> For me, it's like a no-brainer. If And anybody, you know, everyone wants eyeballs. So if you can help people get eyeballs on your content, people will pay you. Mm. And so it's a matter of, you know, how do they learn to optimize, you know, in this case, digital marketing, and then how do they, you know, get clients so they can do that? Um, there's the creative side as well in the UI, UX, the video production, graphic design, whatever it is. And then ultimately software is the most high paying one that takes a little bit longer to get to the point where they're good at that. But um, I have students, I have teenagers uh, taking Harvard CS50, the Harvard's Introduction to Computer Science course, which you can take for free online. So that's why I look at the secondary standard high school curriculum. And yeah, if you want to, you know, go get a PhD at math, you know, at MIT, absolutely, you know, do the regular thing if you want to and so forth. But for, I would say 90, 95, maybe 99% of developing world students, why on earth are they taking this garbage? You know, they should be optimizing for real skills that have cash value now. And the more quickly they do that, you know, in uh, Senegal, average GDP per capita is around $2,000 a year. It would take nothing for a 15-year-old kid to be earning more than the average in his, in his village. You know, mm. so easy. And so I look at education, and a lot of this is 
even all ed tech, most ed tech is optimized for conventional K-12. You know, I, I don't, there are tiny projects I know, but there aren't enough projects focused on liberating the global core from garbage conventional K-12 to mm -hmm. uh, let's make money uh, fast so that we can do good things for our families. And of course, if we create communities with world-class knowledge workers, then, then you attract investors, you know, digital nomads, uh, people looking for you know, permanent residences in these places. And it's not just the knowledge workers, it's things like hospitality work are important. Uh, I don't personally focus on that, but I have great respect for people that are training you know, high-end hospitality work. Uh, because as we develop these free cities around the world, um, you do want great restaurants, you want, you know, great places to socialize and all of the kind of cool vibey stuff that the knowledge workers around the world want. Um, so I, I see opportunities to optimize education in a way that have not yet been done uh, outside of tiny projects here and there. Mm -hmm. So the projects that you just described, uh, uh, you're saying that they are uh, the pro the problem. Sorry, the problems that you just described. You say they are common not just for publicly run schools but also for private schools. Absolutely. Why why is that so? Because you would imagine that a private school is subject to market competition. Uh, why are they suffering from the same uh, backwardness? No, that's a really good question, and a couple of layers to that. First. Um, you know, in many countries, even private education is largely controlled by the state. So sometimes the state requires that private schools teach the same old curriculum, which, you know, maybe they have a little bit of flexibility, but insofar as they are required to teach the same old curriculum, um, they can't really innovate in a fundamental way. Um, even in the United States, where many states provide remarkable freedom for private schools, but then the accreditation agencies um, often limit things in more conventional ways. And that's gradually changing. Um, and to be specific, there is actually a market of, in accreditation in the United States, but um, there are major accreditation agencies that are recognized by the US government. And in order to say, get a student visa or at the college level to get student loans, there, there's a connection between government and the accreditation agency that you know, reduces um, innovation. And then finally, many parents are very conventional and stuck to the old ways, so it seems risky to try something new. Um, and then finally, finally, brick and mortar schools have tend to have quasi-geographical monopolies in many places. You know, in a large city like New York City, there's more of a market in private education for sure. But in a lot of, you know, even in Austin up to maybe 15 years ago, there were a handful of private schools that were not really competing with each other. You know, they had the Episcopal niche and the Catholic niche and, you know, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. where um, one of the great things about uh, both virtual education and then educational savings accounts is to have a real market with multiple competitors. And some of those, some percentage of those are going to be willing to break the standard mode. So just since COVID in the United States, I've seen far more innovation and educational models than ever before. So mm -hmm. again, things are moving in our direction more slowly than I'd like, but we're going there. Mm -hmm. Yes, that that was my next question about how the COVID and the rise for remote working and remote everything has it. So I assume it made uh, this online alternatives more legitimate in the eyes of parents and students. Exactly. A number of things happened. One, many parents uh, saw how terrible regular education was. Um, you know, I think there are a variety of reasons why education has gotten worse. Public education in particular has gotten much worse in the last several decades. So parents may have had a benign experience 20, 30 years ago, and they see what's actually happening in their kid's classroom. They're like, oh my gosh, this is worthless. And so there was a lot more openness to new models. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, I think a lot of people enjoy the flexibility of not being attached to a particular, you know, location. So, you know, one of the brands uh, I have is Expat International School, and we cater towards expats. And expats like the freedom to move anywhere, and they like the the ability to, uh, 
you know, maybe you spend part of the summers in Canada and winters in Panama. And, you know, they are not tied to the school calendar, then they can go six months, six months or whatever. And so I think um, more people are living, I would say, fully digital lifestyles where they work from anywhere and to have their kids be able to go anywhere. I mean, in a certain sense, for those of us who can travel globally, what an incredible time to be alive. I've got several digital nomads who work for me and, you know, three months in the Bahamas, three months in Greece, three months in Tahiti. Like, oh, my God, what a life to live in your 20s. Mm hmm. Yes, exactly. These days, if you call somebody, the first question you ask is, where are you now? Right. You never know. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. I think this kind of incredible lifestyle flexibility, I think this is, will help drive the free city movement, because I, I do have a lot of people who can live anywhere. And when you have a kind of consistent, you know, educational platform and work platform, and you know, that you've got this global community, in some ways, this kind of is where Balaji's network state is going, but I think he is overly skeptical of the reality right now. I think we're making progress right now. And uh, yeah, let's also have the all online communities, but there is a global network of people that are going to relatively free places and living their best life right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So it's good that you mentioned online communities because my next and uh, the last question uh, uh, will be related to that. So last week, uh, I met, uh, I talked to uh, our mutual friend, Gabriel Calzada, who is the ex-president of the Francisco Marroquin University, uh, which is a, a very unique, a legendary, if I may say, educational institution uh, for Latin America that has played uh, a big role in promoting free cities, uh, among many other things that they do. And Gabriel uh, told me, uh, and you're aware of that, I know, because your wife was at the launch of this university, that they have launched a new university, uh, and they will have a campus in the metaverse. So what do you think about the uh, possibilities that metaverse opens for both education and governance? No, I, I think it's, it's really exciting. And so... First, I think people will always want meet space relationship. You know, it's nice to talk to people and hug people and see them eye to eye and so forth. And um, just having access to a metaverse with really infinite possibilities is super exciting. And so we have, um, I, I actually see people having this radical flexibility of lifestyle where they have diverse communities in the metaverse and diverse activities uh, that will be increasingly kind of real and diverse. And um, there will be places where these people do uh, have physical realities. And um, yeah, people will kind of congregate around a certain idea or belief system or occupation or activity or whatever in the metaverse. And then uh, they'll go and live physical lives as they build these virtual communities and real communities. Um, and I think, you know, especially those of us who haven't bought into the establishment system, you know, most of the world still believes that, you know, governments are uh, well-intentioned and benign. <laughs> you know, it seems so crazy. But those of us who think that a better world is possible through more private initiative, we're able to find each other at scale, relate to each other at scale, innovate at scale. Um, and I think that that will be the seed to a much more positive future. And as we educate more young people into this you know, world of optimistic possibilities. And just on this, I think we are the most optimistic possibility in the world. You know, um, people who are worried about you know, environmental catastrophe or endless racial conflict or you know, debt crises or you know, horrible wars, all of these things are real. And yet ultimately, I think the path forward is more and more energy going towards win-win um, voluntary solutions through free private cities and private communities online. Voluntary communities is better than private, actually. Voluntary communities online. I think I called myself a voluntarist. Mm -hmm. So as we have a more fully voluntary world, a lot of the horrific things that happen on a routine basis in the world we live in today will gradually fade into the past. And people at some point will think, oh my God, they used to support government to do this. <laughs> All this war and murder and death and destruction and everything. Wow, how the dark ages back in, you know, 2022. Mm -hmm. 
Michael, you are your screen is frozen, I guess. Yes, you're back. Okay. So I so I understand that uh, your your opinion is that metaverse and other virtual solutions they will not replace the physical uh, f physical interactions. They will be in addition to to it. A absolutely, and you know, in my school, we're looking forward to having kind of a VR experience where we can all be sitting. You know, I it'd be fun if you and I could. Feel like we're sitting in a living room together zoom is you know kind of vaguely sort of but you know flat and everything but how much cooler if we had 3d realities and we could do that and then yeah you know next time i can go to prague or wherever and we can have a real conversation in person so uh, you know let's have the best of both worlds exactly exactly so that brings me back to uh the conference that we are having next weekend uh which will happen both uh, online and offline. Offline, it will be in Prague, uh, and online, it it will be on Zoom. So uh, you can, what if you if you want to, you can join either online or offline. So uh, I'm now addressing the the viewers. Uh, check the Liberty LifetimeLiberty.com website for the programs, the details, the tickets, and everything you would know you want to know about uh this exciting event which we are all looking forward to michael thank you very much for your time today and uh see you soon at terrific thank Labor you so much in our lifetime thank, thank you, you so much Vera. it's been a blast thanks bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.